I'm not sure if you have your papers from last week or not. Psalm 86 9. That's where I have. We, we finished up with drawing an eye to God. We talked about talk, listen, read, no worship. Uh, and the last word was entire, right? And that's where we stopped. All right. Does someone want to read Psalms 89, 86, verse 9? Oh, go ahead, brother. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee. O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. All nations which thou hast... How many nations have God made? All of them. All of them. So they're all going to come uh, 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 and worship. Praise and worship is an offering we give to God. It is the very reason He created us. Created is a word. It is the very reason he created us. The blight there in Psalms 86, I didn't know about that. Uh, hopefully I got all nations. So praise and worship is an offering we give to God. It is the very reason that he has created us. Someone read Revelation chapter number 4, verse number 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor. Amen. So for thy pleasure, P-L-E-A-S-U-R-E, P-L-E-A-S-U-R-E. -E. Let's talk about that verse for a moment. Uh, uh, the, the writer here, John of Revelation, uh, as he speaks of, of, of uh, the 24 elders, uh, he is speaking, uh, and, and he's talking about, uh, here he says, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor 
and power. The beginning part of worship is this for us, is that we have to come to a, 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 a spiritual but also a physical cognizance that God is worthy of all glory, He's worthy of all honor, and He's worthy of all power. And until we come to that ourselves, we really don't know true worship. God is worthy. He's worthy of all honor. All honors above honors. He's worthy of all power. Everything that we can muster, every strength that is in us, He's worthy of the power that we can give to Him. And He's worthy, uh, uh, the Word of God says, that we're worthy to receive glory. So when we come to the realization that God is, is, is worthy, when it sits by the worshiper, the real worshiper will realize his own unworthiness. I'm unworthy, but I'm glad that I get to come and worship a very worthy, a very holy, a very powerful, a very honorable God. For you have created all things. God's created all things. Everything that we are, everything that we have, everything that is around us, God has created. And to realize that it was for God's pleasure that we were created. Do you realize that God took pleasure in creating us and we should take pleasure in worshiping Him? Amen. It should be a desire of our heart in worship to bring pleasure to God. Amen. We got to worship in spirit true. That's right, brother. Eli. But it should be for his, not for our pleasure, but our worship should bring pleasure to God. You 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 probably met someone before that you wanted to give them pleasure by what you've said or what you've done or your acts. However, it is you want to bring them pleasure. There may be times where you do things for your pleasure. Worship is not for our pleasure. Worship is for God's pleasure. Amen. I don't want to get ahead of myself. So, once again, the seeker-sensitive church, worship, praise and worship, most oftentimes becomes about the pleasure they can receive. How do I feel about this? What am I benefiting from this? I promise you, we will receive pleasure in our worship, but our goal should be for our gratification. It should be for the gratification and the pleasure of God. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me jump down here. Have you ever wondered why you were born? Have you ever wondered why you were born? Anyone ever wonder that? You don't have to raise your hand. Because really the truth is we've all wondered that. Why am I here? What am I doing? Well, uh, uh, when we uh, the reason for our being on earth, uh, God created you to bring Him pleasure. So some folks said, I look for my purpose, what should I be? Uh, what skills should I hone that I can become very good at? Uh, what, why am I here? i got to find. The, the bottom line is that yes, we will all occupy until Jesus comes. And he gives us a choice to do that. I believe he gives us leading in that, that we need to find out, God, what's your direction? But, but some of us may have very God-given skills. And some of us may have some great abilities. So even in what we do and what we live, our job should be to bring God pleasure. Mm -hmm. That's the whole purpose, why we were born to pleasure God. And so, uh, uh, living a lifestyle that is pleasing, pleasing to Him gives Him glory and honor. Are you fulfilling His purpose? Amen, we were, Brother Eli. If we were made for His pleasure, shouldn't we please Him with our life? Amen. This life is not for our pleasure. Don't let the world rub off on you and get you confused and mixed up and get you to buy into their philosophy. Because it's a damning philosophy. It's an antichrist philosophy. The Word of God tells us that we were created for His pleasure. So whatever we do in life, uh, our, our job set, 
our, our marriage, our parenting, our grandparenting, our living life in our community, whatever it is, all of that should be, first of all, rooted in that we want to bring God pleasure. Does God get pleasure out of this? Does God get glory out of what I'm doing and the way that I'm living my life? If we really love God, really adore Him like we think we do, shouldn't our praise and worship be manifested? Manifested, M-A-N-I-F-S-T-E-D, manifested in every aspect, in, in, in every aspect of our lives. So everything that we do, even in our mundane days, we all have the mundane days. We all have the crazy days. We all have the days that we struggle to get along with someone. Even when they rub us the wrong way. <clears throat> even in those moments of not liking what we're doing, Sometimes we may not like it, but understand that it is an opportunity to pray to God you. Whatever it is, is an opportunity for us to manifest our love toward God in our life. And I'm not, I'm not pointing at other churches. I'm not pointing at it. Please understand what I'm saying. I think what you said tonight in the modern being other places, I think what makes a difference in a group of worshipers is, and you can have a humongous crowd that can do this, but I think the gift that we have is that we do desire to manifest praise in every area of our life, all of us. So when we come together in a collective form as the body of Christ, it's seen as well. Amen. God gets pleasure in that. That's right, the very life. And that's what we should be doing. Someone read Psalms uh, 138 1. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the God will, sing, uh, will I sing praise unto thee. Amen. With my whole heart. My whole heart. Now, I already got ahead of myself when I shared this past service since Tuesday night, but that's okay because it touched me so much. Where is God? Someone read Psalms 22 3. But thou art holy, O thou inhabitest the praises of Israel. O thou that inhabitest, I N H A B I T E S T. I N H A B I T E S T. We are Israel by adoption. A place is inhabited. If a place is inhabited, it is lived in. God lives. God lives in our praise. Our lives need to worship Him in everything we do. If we praise Him only in church, only in church, or when we, uh, or when gathered with others, uh, does that mean that He is not there when we are, are, are somewhere else? What did the psalmist write in Psalms 119, verse number 164? It's a number. I said it on Sunday morning. That's right, you got your pay attention. Seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgments. Let me stop here for a minute. All right, so does that mean that, Dennis, I get up in the morning and I get me a little tally sheet and I'm going to mark there for every time that I praise God. And I want the total of the day, Brother Doug, to be equivalent to seven. That's really not what the psalmist meant to understand the, the context of the Word of God is when we look at numerology and we know what seven is, the number of perfection. But it, it's not just perfection, it's a number of completeness. Our days should be complete in praising God. 
You know, not just when we come together corporately to worship, because there's others and there's music and there's clapping, and it's what we do when we come to the four walls of the church, but, but our lives are the church. We are the church. So when we are dispersed, our, our, the, the goal of our life and the commandment of God's word is, is that completely in a day will I praise thee because of thy righteous judgment. There needs to be a fulfillment of praise throughout our day. So our life needs to get up singing and worshiping God. And everything that we do uh, needs to be praised to God because it's a lifestyle. Because we are worshipers. We're not just when we come together because it's what we do on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Tuesday night, but it's because we are worshipers because we found that we have a purpose. We have been created to bring pleasure to God, and when we live our life in a fulfillment of worship, then God has pleasure in all of our days. Amen. And He wants to have pleasure in our days. To praise God seven times a day would be an improvement for some of us. For others, it would be an insignificant number. He inhabits our praises, not just at church, but at home, at work, in the car, mowing the lawn, doing the dishes, folding the laundry. If we are praising Him. So everything. There's a couple of those things right there that maybe some of you would say, oh, that's not what I like to do. <coughs> You know, uh, all of us, maybe, you know, run this. Uh, you bailed me out last year and you mowed my grass a couple times. I never got to it. You got there before I did because you like that mower. Sometimes I, I really enjoy mowing grass, but sometimes it's all I can get to. Um, some of you ladies really like folding laundry. Or after the fourth basket, you're like, oh, I'm not allowed another load of laundry. Or whatever it is, I'm just using an illustration. Whatever it is, but really to take hold of that, that we can even be worshiping God while we're doing those things. Whatever it is. If you're not busy, you gotta buy yourself some goats and put tons in your yard. That's a good idea. I'll keep it right now. That's right, you don't live too far from me. You don't live too far from me. You can come up and adjust their, their feeding goats. Thanks for the idea. Well, they you are fertilizer, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, praise God. Amen. It's a win-win situation, right? Amen. <laughs> no, I enjoy bone grass, actually. <laughs> so I want to read 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16 and 18. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything, give thanks. God says it's His will. So if we want to live our life with purpose, know why we're here, the will of God is for us to worship Him. Bottom line. If we are praising Him, He is there. He's living with, with us, and in us. Amen. That's good. Run your head. Dear God. His presence... His very nearness gives us peace, joy, strength, and help. Do you ever notice it really does change things when you begin to worship God? Mm -hmm. When you just realize that He's here in this. I love that when I see someone in the hospital, and, you know, I know it can be a fearful time. No one knows what's going to happen when you go into that procedure. And sometimes you don't know what those diagnostic tests are going to reveal. Sometimes it's painful to do what you need to do to recover, but it's part of the rehabilitation process to get you back where you need to be. But I love when I run into folks, and I know it's hard, but they're praising God. But they learn to get that when we praise Him, we learn that He's right there with us. Mm -hmm. It gives us that knowledge and it brings a sense of him dwelling up inside of us that he's with us and in us. Someone read Psalms 138, verse 2 and 3. Thou answerest me and strengthenest me with strength in my soul. 
In the day when I cry, thou answerest me. The day when I cry. Verse, page number four. As we pray to him, he strengthens us. His word and his name strengthen us. Our praise to him gives us peace and strength. Someone read. Oh, let me just, let me not get ahead of myself. If we are praising him in everything that we do, we will be more careful to make sure everything we do pleases pleases him and brings him glory. What does Paul say to the Thessalonica people in, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 22? Does anyone know what that is? Abstain from the appearance of evil. So if we're praising God, the thing that we're going to do in our life if we're, we're constantly praising God, we are going to be doing things that pleases God. And so Paul said abstain from those things, the, 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 the appearance of evil. We not only abstain or stay away from doing evil, but we will stay away from the things that give the appearance that we might be doing evil. We all have been called. We all have been called. We have been chosen. It's up to us to make the next move. Let's stop right there for a second. So if we're praising God and everything that we do, you know, uh, it, it will help us in the places that we go. There's some places we just won't go because it doesn't bring glory and honor and praise to God. And you know, it will help us in what we say because sometimes the things that we say, the tongue is, it's, James says it's a very little uh, member, but it's very hard to rule. He said it's like that bit in the horse's mouth. It's a little bit, boy, you know, uh, uh, it's like uh, uh, the boat that, 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 that's had a very small piece that, that takes, us in, takes it in the direction. It's, a, it's an unruly the tongue is terrible, but when we are caught up in our life of praising God, we won't be gossiping. We won't be speaking slanderous things to people. We won't be speaking vulgarity. Uh, we won't be speaking things that later we'll regret. Amen. But we'll choose to please God because everything that we say, we want it to bring praise to God. And even the places that we go, the way that we conduct ourselves, our attitudes, uh, you, you know, really, uh, uh, if we think and we're cognizant in worship and prayer, it'll just change everything about us. Everything. It'll change the way that we dress. You know, it'll be a holier dress and lifestyle. You know, It'll change the things that we look at on the computer. It'll change the things that we look at on the television. It'll change the things that we listen to on the radio. Really, it will change everything. Because our life will be about worship and praise and bringing pleasure to God. And if these other things aren't bringing pleasure to God, well, then we want to abstain from them. And we'll find ourselves even want to, wanting to abstain from the very appearance of evil. Because we want God to be glorified. Someone read Ephesians 1, verse 4 through 6. So the first word is chosen. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Let me just stop here for a moment and just, uh, just describe something. I was trying to turn my Bible. So when we look at what Paul writes to the church of Ephesus, and he's saying... 
as He has chosen us. Do you know that we are saved because Christ has chosen us? He said, before the foundation of the world. Now, most scholars would say that this isn't necessarily looking individually, although it could be individually. But it's looking across the board that God knew before he created the world and created man that man would fall and he'd have to send his only begotten son. God knew that. However, God still wanted to create the earth and every individual on the earth. You know why? Because they were created for his pleasure and for his worship. And he wanted that even though he knew that man would fall into sin. And the Bible says that God had already planned to send His Son before the world was born to be uh, the, the Lamb of God that was slain. God already chose that. Think about how special you are tonight. You did not choose God. God chose you. You may say, Brother Seville, but I chose God. No, 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 no. If you, you reciprocated because God first chose you, and then you were convicted, and you were drawn to Him, and you chose Him. But if it were not for God choosing you first, you would have never had a relationship with Him. And so the Word of God goes on down to say uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, having predestinated us uh, unto the adoption of children. Once again, it's not just one person. This is across the board. And you may say, Brother Seville, I believe God only chose certain people to be saved because the Word of God says that here. Well, you're not taking the Word of God in, in context. You have to take the entirety of the Word of God to understand this verse. That it would nullify that God sent His only begotten Son into all the world. That whosoever believeth in Him. So God didn't just choose me to be saved tonight or you to be saved tonight. God desired the whole world to be saved. And He sent His only begotten Son because He wants all of us to bring pleasure to Him. Amen. However, only some of us respond. To the Word and to the Spirit of God. He made us agents of our free will. And so when we choose that, God finds pleasure in us. And then when we worship Him, God finds pleasure in us worshiping Him. Because He wanted that long before He ever formed the world. He desired to have our worship. Because it brings Him pleasure. Is that awesome tonight? That God wants our worship so much that even though He knew man would fall, He still created us because He wanted pleasure in us. So I want to read Ephesians 5, verse 19 and 20. Amen. So that is speaking to yourself in psalms and hymns. When it says speaking to yourselves, or as we say, talking to yourselves, we don't usually do that when others are around. We are by ourselves. We aren't usually by ourselves in church. We need to learn to praise God and worship Him wherever, wherever we are and whatever we are doing. Let me just stop there for a minute. How many of you would agree with that statement that typically, you know, if, if I come in here and I was talking to myself, and I was church service long, I was talking to myself, would you say, Sister Doc would say, something is wrong with the pastor. That ain't right. That ain't normal. <laughs> but I, I, oh, don't worry, I talk to myself all the time. But typically not when people surround me. You know, I, I mean, I, 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 I do that because, you know, um, I want to be careful with my wordage here, my perfect, so I'm not even going down that trip. But most of the time, it's when others aren't around. Or maybe you don't realize someone's around, maybe you're talking to yourself. We all do that. We typically don't do that when we're in church. It would be chaos when we all come in and start talking to ourselves. 
And I'd say, Marty, I'm like, Marty, what is going on with this church, right? But it's usually when we're by ourselves. And so it's, I think it's easy to say that we should speak to ourselves in songs and hymns. Music is powerful. Sometimes we'll find ourselves humming or singing. We may not even realize it, but it brings us to worship. And when we speak in psalms and hymns, it could be the word of God that we're speaking in to give ourselves doctrine. We're speaking in that to give praise to God. And so that next paragraph, we need to make praise and worship our lifestyle. It will affect what we do, what we say, how we live. We need to listen, L-I-S-T-E-N, to what God says about how we are to live. Uh, that next one we're going to talk about in forthcoming lessons. So, you may say, but this is not a very good singer. Well, I dare say that probably all of you probably sing in the shower or sing somewhere around your home or in your vehicle. God's not looking for our melody to be perfect and on the pitch. Not all of us are skilled with those skills. But he wants us to praise and worship him. That's what he's asking. Not just in church, but all the time. We speak to ourselves. We learn to worship God in effect with our lifestyle. The whole purpose of worship is not to make us feel good. F E-E-L, feel good. If that were the case, we would be worshiping our feelings. We would be worshiping our feelings. And that, and that would be idolatry. I-D-O-L-A-T-R-Y. I-D-O-L-A-T-R-Y. The goal of worship is to make God, to make God feel good. When we accomplish that, we feel good. Makes sense, doesn't it? So while folks say that, you know, God's, God's concerned about how I feel, well, God's really concerned about us worshiping Him mm -hmm. because that's what we're created for. And when we get to true worship, where we really bring pleasure to God, we will feel good. Because it brings the holiness of God down, it brings the presence of God down, and we realize that He is with us and He's in us because He lives in our praise. And until we get to the place that we really praise and worship God, God will not inhabit that. But when we find real worship and praise, God inhabits and we'll feel good. That's why some folks can come into church and they may say, I don't know worship today. I don't, I don't feel like it. Worship isn't based upon how we feel. Mm -hmm. God is still good whether we're healthy or whether we're sick. God is still good whether the sun is shining, whether it's, it's, it's raining. God is still worthy to be worshipped regardless of what our attitude is like or how our day is going. So worship isn't about how we feel. It has nothing at all to do with our feelings. It has all to do with bringing pleasure to God and making Him feel good. And in return, we'll find that most... How many of how many's ever, you know, your day's busy. It's not that you don't want to come to church and be here, but it's the effort, it's the energy, and you just think, I can rest, and, you know, but once you do it, you're like, I'm so glad I did that. Because it's worship to God. Because it's not about what we feel. It's about worshiping Him. And in return, when we're really worshiping, we feel good. We cannot worship Him in the way He created us to worship Him until we worship Him in spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. In surrender, S-U-R-R-E-N, 
D E R, and obedience. O B E D I E N C E. Impurity. P U R I T Y. And holiness. H O L I N E S S. Someone read 1 Chronicles 16 29. What, excuse me, what was that one after B? A purity. P U R I T Y. And then it's holy and, and holiness. Can someone read 1 Chronicles 16 29? Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come unto him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Amen. So our offering, we bring it to him and we worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. The Hebrew translation for this verse, for holiness, is dedicated, pure, P-U-R-E, holy, sanctified, clean, very good, and hollow. I'm going to read these next couple of phrases and then I'm going to stop, even though we're kind of in the middle of the thought. So I'm going to go down to the top of the page, just give me a few moments. I love what Sister Rachel said. I love that old song, Sister Rachel. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And so God requires us to be clean. WWJD, what would Jesus do? Has become popular. We see it over, we see it all over. What would Jesus do? Do we really care, or is it just a cute little cliche that we wear, but don't adhere to? What about some more of these acrostics? Think about this. What would Jesus say? How do you think he would talk? Do you think he would talk like you? I, I had some teenager today. I had to. Um, I asked, how are you doing? And they replied back to me. I can't even tell you the word they use. I said, I'm sorry, can I have an interpretation on that? Because I'm clueless as to what that word means. And the word was cool. I'm cool. I'm like, well, why don't you just say I'm cool? I, I was thinking that I didn't say that. How would Jesus talk? I, I really don't see Jesus saying, I'm cool. Sorry, I don't. I see him being very respectful by the hour in which we live. I think I see him using proper etiquette. What would Jesus wear? Um, that's an interesting topic, isn't it? What would Jesus wear? Shouldn't we desire to be like him and our worship? Should we wear that? What would Jesus watch? You know, that's from YouTube to internet, television, to even just things that are played out in life. What would Jesus watch? What would Jesus give? What would he give in his praise? What would he give to others? What would he give in church? What would Jesus eat? That's interesting too, isn't it? You know, he would be an example of showing that his body is the temple of the Spirit of God. So how would he eat? What would Jesus drink? Where would Jesus live? What would Jesus desire? Where would Jesus work? I can tell you some places I know he wouldn't work. What would Jesus sing? You know, the enemy, um, he loves to work through song. And if he can get folks singing about all of life's problems to make you doubt God and feel depressed and get your eyes off God or even if it's just a little jingle to keep you from thinking about God. He would do that, wouldn't he? What would Jesus play? I where fear comes in too. Get you off of thinking of great. Amen. You're right. Where would Jesus go? 
Who would Jesus date? I just read an article today. It was good. Uh, I think it was from Focus on the Family. About the importance of not planning on marrying someone who you desire to change. It ain't going to happen. What would Jesus hear? What would Jesus read? What would Jesus believe? You probably come up with, you could probably come up with some more, but let's seriously think about this. Can we pattern our lives to ask these questions of everything we do? Really, we should. If we would consistently, consistently follow these sayings, we could turn the first, the most popular, what would Jesus do, around, and we could say it this way. Devil just won't win. I'm going to give you the first phrase of the next one. Worship is obeying God. So many people like praise and worship. And they lift their hands. And, but they never lift their hearts and surrender. They never understand what they're raising their hands is about. It's the action of the heart. Lifting it up to God. It's lifting up holy hands to God. Not having sinful things in our life, but holy, pure hands before God. A sign of surrender. A sign of our heart or our heart being the seat of our affection. Showing that our affection is lifted up before God because that brings God pleasure when the most sacred, affectionate part of our life is lifted up to Him. And it all starts with obedience. That is worshiping God in spirit and in truth. I'm going to stop there because I feel like I went long enough. I want to give you a few moments if you'd like to share. Is this okay?